Naming molecular compounds, aka the nomenclature of molecular compounds, is going to be the topic of this lesson. We're going to look at the IUPAC rules for naming what are called binary molecular compounds specifically. Binary meaning there's only two elements in these molecular compounds that's as complex as we're going to get. We're going to go through several examples and we'll find out that this is probably a little bit easier than naming ionic compounds, which we saw in the last lesson. Now this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist and I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. Let's get into this. All right, so just a reminder, molecular compounds are non-metal with non-metal and typically those are binaries. Um, so if you have more than two non-metals, we're not naming those here. We're only gonna name the binary molecular compounds. And just as a reminder, your non-metals are right up here and also include hydrogen. You'll find out that even some of the metalloids though usually get grouped into this kind of system of nomenclature as well. So, and this is gonna be a little bit easier than naming ionic compounds. Ionic compounds, we had to worry about, you know, charges and sometimes Roman numerals and sometimes not and stuff. And it turns out that if we use that system here with molecular compounds, it would get very complicated in a hurry. And so they just came up with an easier system. And the truth is, I just wish they would have used this system like for the ionic compounds. It would have made life so much easier. So let's take a look at several compounds here. And we'll start with N2O4. And there's part of this that's gonna be similar to what we did last time. So we're gonna name, it turns out, the first element first and the second element second. So we'll name them in the order they're listed in the chemical formula. So we can't really say cation and anion anymore. These are not ionic compounds. We don't have ions. So, but we'll name the first element first and the second element second. And we'll name that first element, we'll say nitrogen. And when you name the second element in your binary molecular compound, you are gonna end it with an IDE ending. And so this part is what is similar to what we saw with naming ionic compounds. However, before both of these, we may involve putting a prefix on the front. And so it turns out we have numerical prefixes for pretty much like one through 10 is what's typical. And so you've got mono for one and di for two, so, so on and so forth. And I'll put that list right up on the board here, one side or the other here, uh, that's on the study guides here. And so we've got mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, and deca. And some of those will be familiar, like deca for decade, 10 years, and octa, like an octa, and hexa like a hexagon, but hepta and nana, not the most common things in the world, but also not the most common you're going to see in the compounds, it turns out. So, uh, but tetra, like tetris, and everything that falls down your screen in tetris is composed of four boxes. Uh, for those of you that are old enough to have played tetris somewhere in your life. Uh, so, but tetra means four. Uh, and so in this case, we're gonna use those lovely prefixes to give the numerical number of each of these in the formula. So like instead of just saying nitrogen, we're gonna say dinitrogen. So we'll put that prefix right at the front. So it's one word here, dinitrogen. And instead of saying just plain old oxide, we're gonna put tetra at the front. So, but what we're gonna find is that it would sound weird if we said tetraoxide, and they often avoid these vowel-vowel sounds. Not every time, but almost every time. And we're gonna do that here. And so instead of saying tetraoxide, start over here, we're just gonna say tetraoxide. And so this is dinitrogen tetroxide, N2O4. And this is easy, and it's easy to go from the formula to the name, and it's easy to go from the name back to the formula. Uh, and again, I, I, students often find this much easier than the system of rules we use for naming ionic compounds. The big mistake comes, though, when students start trying to use the ionic rules for naming molecular compounds or using the molecular rules for naming ionic compounds. And so you really got to get good at identifying which kind of compounds you have and then using the appropriate set of rules, especially on a multiple choice test. Uh, professors are really good at making detractors, wrong answers, uh, that just use the wrong system of rules and stuff like that. So you really want to get that down. Let's look at a couple more though, because there's a couple of exceptions we need to address. All right, so it turns out that the vast majority of molecular compounds have only one of the first elements. Like N2O4 is not the most common thing in the world, but it had two of the first element. And so, but the vast majority have only one of the first element. And when that's the case, they just said, well, because that's so common and kind of the standard, if you will, we'll leave off the prefix mono for that first element. And so in this case, for CO2, we're not gonna say monocarbon, we're just gonna say carbon. So, and then we're gonna say dioxide.
So we're still going to use that prefix for the second one here for dioxide. We're just not going to use it for the first one. Now, it turns out when we've got CO here, we're going to do the same thing again for carbon. We're not going to say monocarbon. We're just going to say carbon. But if you've got one of the second element, odds are you're probably still going to have to include mono here. And we are here. And so instead of saying monoxide, we're going to drop one of those O's to avoid that double O sound. Monoxide, we're just going to say monoxide. And many of you probably already knew that the name of this was carbon monoxide. And so we still used that lovely prefix there. Cool. Now, here's the deal. I've kind of given you the rule here that says like, with, you only have one of the first element, leave off the mono. If you only have one of the second elements, still include the mono. What the real rule actually states is that when it's not clear, you need to include that prefix. And when it is clear, you don't. So, and I've tried to really distill what does it mean like clear, you know, it's, it's a little bit of vague wording here. And what it means is that, you know, in this case, carbon and oxygen, so combine in two different combinations. In both cases, it's only one carbon. And so monocarbon is the default in both cases. That's not different. But because there is a different option for the number of oxygens, it needs to be specified every time, whether there's two or whether there's one. And so usually that's going to be uh, something we see more commonly on the second element with the first element being the one where we drop the mono and things of a sort. But it is not the only place. So there's things like hydrogen sulfide, H2S, where there's two H's and we don't say dihydrogen sulfide, we just say hydrogen sulfide. But it turns out that's the only combination of hydrogen and sulfur there is. So now I say that only to show you that that's an exception kind of to the rules that I've given you and stuff like that. But it's also an exception you're not likely going to encounter. So if you just stick with the rules where if there's only one of the first element, leave off the mono. But if there's only one of the second element, still include the mono, that should serve you well, I just wanted to make a, a quick point that it's not the real complete set of rules that maybe you encounter somewhere down the road, probably far beyond this class. Cool, that's it. That's all of naming binary molecular compounds. Like I said, much easier than naming ionic compounds. So uh, in the next lesson, we're going to look at naming the two different types of acids, and that's going to add just one more wrinkle into this. If you found this lesson helpful, give me a like and a share. Let's YouTube know that they should share it with other students as they're probably going to find it equally helpful. Uh, just want to let you know that I've got this entire playlist and course embedded on my website for free as well. And in addition to the video lessons, I've also got most of what you find on the study guides embedded alongside the video. So I'll leave the link in the description for this particular lesson. I also want to let you know of my general chemistry master course, where on top of the videos and study guides, I've also got tons and tons of practice problems, over 1,200 currently. Uh, practice tests, uh, final exam rapid reviews, practice final exams, and a free trial is available. Happy studying.